Welcome, everybody. I'm David Kennedy, and uh, I guess I'm known mostly on this campus as the guy who preceded Bruce Kane as director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. And we're very happy at the Lane Center to be the co-sponsors, along with the history department, uh, of this uh, the, the inaugural lecture and what will be a year-long series uh, of lectures about the history of the American West. And I want to thank Catherine Olivarius. Where are you, Catherine? For being my partner here in the history department and helping make this uh, happen. There'll be five more lectures this year and possibly an extended extension of the series next year. And our purpose is really to share with this community, the history department not least of all, uh, some of the richness and dynamism uh, in the broader field of Western history, which has long been a pillar of this department's faculty going back to my now deceased colleagues, Don Fehrenbacher and David Potter, and more recently, of course, Richard White. And as we'll hear tonight, a sample of the dynamism that is uh, animating this field, there are a lot of things going on in Western history that concern the environment, Native Americans, technology, federalism, water, energy, and immigration, just to name some of the more salient ones. So it's my particular pleasure to get this inaugural lecture going this, this afternoon uh, with Louis Warren, who's come all the way down from Davis to uh, honor us with his presence. Uh, Louis is a son of the West. He was born in Pocatello and raised in Nevada. He underwent a little bit of seasoning in Zimbabwe and the United Kingdom and New York City, where he was an undergraduate at Columbia, and then several years of purgatory in New Haven, Connecticut, <laughs> where, <laughs> I say that from experience, where he got his PhD at Yale. He's long taught at UC Davis. He was a resident scholar with us at the Lane Center nine years ago, 2013-14 academic year. Um, he's published in several subfields of Western history, biography, including a notable biography of William Cody, otherwise known as Buffalo Bill. He's published a textbook in environmental history and more recently in Native American history, particularly a 2017 title, God's Red Sun, the Ghost Dance Religion and the Making of Modern America, which, among other things, won the Bancroft Prize in 2018, another marker of the salience of Western history in our general guild. Today he's going to be talking about the title you see on the screen, Blood Money, California's Indian War Bonds and the Financing of the Settler State. So Louis, welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. David, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm uh, working on a project about how California grew and what it cost from 1848 to now. And in launching that project, um, I start as a historian of the American West and an environmental historian. I've also written in Native American history, cultural history, uh, social history, the history of religion and spiritual practice in my most recent book, this launch into the history of capitalism and finance is new, and I hope you find the talk informative. I'll be talking about bonds, which gets a little bit technical in places, and I've had to learn a lot about bonds just to get as far as I have. I'm sure I have a good deal more to learn. I know you're all up on how bonds work because you've got Destin Jenkins here. Uh, but I, I'm learning it as I go along. Uh, I do teach at UC Davis. I've taught there for a long time, and I've taught California history for many years. California has an uneasy relationship with the West, at least among Western historians and even among the public. Uh, many feel that California is somehow not really Western. Uh, among Western historians, Patty Limerick, most famously among the new Western historians, has expressed grave doubts on this subject. Um, uh, there's a very famous Western historian from years past uh, who once said, I wouldn't let California into the West with a search warrant. <laughs> uh, it's, it, there are various uh, claims there. It's too urban. It develops differently. It's, uh, it's, it's, too, it's somehow too modern. It's too different. But I'm writing a book that shows how California was central to Western development and US development. And it is a window on national and global history by virtue of what makes it seem so exceptional. Um, and one of the reasons I chose California growth uh, as my subject for this book was that growth and success are the things that people most associate California with. This is what California's extraordinary growth and extraordinary wealth and power. 
uh, is one is the thing that when you say California anywhere around the world, that's pretty much what starts to come to people's minds very quickly. The critical part of understanding California's 19th century uh, is the history of Native American dispossession and the replacement of Native American people by settler populations, the essence of settler colonialism. There is a large and essential scholarship on genocide of California's native people, stretching all the way back to Hubert Howe Bancroft, who called uh, what happened to Native American people in California one of the last human hunts of civilization and the basest and most brutal of them all. And that work, that, that kind of argument would get picked up by Sherburne Cook at UC Berkeley in 1943, Robert Heiser at Berkeley in the 1970s, most recently in comprehensive studies by Brendan Lindsay uh, in his book called Murder State, and Benjamin Madley in his book American Genocide. With the, what, these, what these authors seek to explain um, is partly these population figures. That at the beginning of the Spanish colonization period, you know, we think there are probably 300,000 native people in California, in what is now California. We don't really know. It's an estimate some people think is higher, uh, but 300,000 is kind of the more conservative estimate. By 1846, when the U.S. occupation of California begins after Spain and then Mexico have both colonized California, the population of native people was probably around 150,000. And by 1880, it's down to 16,277. And what happens in that period after the U.S. takes over uh, is a whole series, many, many massacres, mass kidnappings, physical assault, starvation of people as they're pushed off their land uh, and pushed aside to make way primarily for cattle uh, in much of the, uh, over much of the homeland of Native people. Native death rates were high, and birth rates, obviously, and the ability to regenerate communities becomes, uh, is low in, in these years. Scholars tend to agree that most Indian killings were the result of vigilante activity, which was pervasive and relentless, and impossible for the most part to fully quantify. These free-form people who would go out uh, murdering uh, American Indian people and enslaving their children. This was the way a lot of this worked. But the state of California also authorized and paid for frequent expeditions by the state militia. Starting in 1850, governors of the state called out the militia every other year until the Civil War, which Civil War doesn't end it, but we'll, we'll talk about what happens in the Civil War as I get to the end of the talk. These so-called expeditions were key to creating an atmosphere of official tolerance for vigilante killings that occurred in nearly every month of every year in these decades. So you have a lot of vigilante killings of Indians, people going out and shooting Indians on sight, right? shooting Native people, uh, plundering their belongings, taking their belongings, and as I've mentioned, taking their children. And that is punctuated every other year by an official militia expedition that will, be head, will head out under the orders of the state governor. And you can see here, these are, this is a list of Indian war liabilities in a form submitted for the Adjutant General of California, uh, the guy who's in charge of the state militia. This was compiled for a report in 1890. Uh, you got the Mar these are the names of expeditions, Mariposa and Monterey, the first El Dorado, second El Dorado, and these are the amounts of money they cost, Mariposa and Monterey. Uh, Mariposa expedition is the one where the, so the, the militia goes up to Yosemite and removes native people from Yosemite, and that is the first time that white people come down from those mountains talking about the beauties of Yosemite after they've depopulated the valley. $259,000, sorry, $259,372.31 that expedition cost, right? And you can go right down the list. Second El Dorado is over $200,000. Um, some of them are much cheaper than others, but generally speaking, these go on through the 1850s up to the early 1860s. The total debt is $850,000 down there. Now, um, the scholarship of California Indian con conquest has been rightly influential, and we've learned a good deal from it. Right? Uh, Benjamin Madley, in particular, has pointed out the role of the state and federal government in supporting genocidal campaigns by settlers. It was when reading uh, Madley's book was the first time I saw, he mentions Indian war bonds in the book, and I had never heard of those before. And when looking into the Indian war documents in California State Archives during COVID, 
I was surprised to find that much of the correspondence and many of the documents concern the financing of these campaigns and the controversies around that financing. Um, I, I had found the finding guide for the, what's called the Indian War Collection in the State Archives online during the, the tw summer of 2020, when everything was shut down. Um, and I, I got online and I, mean, I, and I started corresponding with an archivist who was at work, at least remotely, but the place was shut down. And he was able to send me a uh, CD-ROM of the collection, three, three CD-ROM set of all the documents in the Indian War Collection. And when you read them, a lot of the correspondence and many of the reports that are generated are actually about the financing and the money. And yet, beyond knowing that state and federal officials wrote checks for these expeditions, there's not been any sustained inquiry into where that money came from. We all know that settlers killed Indians to take their land, but the process was expensive. Mass killing and dispossession, it turns out, is not, are not cheap. To quote Emily Connolly, who's writing a book on the history of the management, mismanagement of Indian trust funds. Uh, to quote Emily Connolly, if land was the why of United States colonialism, money was the how. If we follow the money, where does it lead? Who paid for California's mass murder and why? Now, I should say that all of my work throughout my career has a consistent theme of tracking and explaining, exploring, illuminating how Native people respond to the kinds of challenges I'm gonna be talking about today. And this is a big question in California history. How do Native American people survive all of this, right? That is something that, that I will be dealing with less in this talk because here I'm talking about a structure of oppression and how it gets built. And I will gesture in the direction, I hope by the end, uh, of where this can take us with Native American history and how they respond to these challenges. But for right now, I'm gonna be talking about where all this money comes from. And today I'm gonna to explore how the state's militia campaigns against Native people were financed with investor capital. This study of how the California's genocide was paid for connects the history of America's settler colonial expansion with the history of capitalism, connecting us also to the field of racial capitalism teaching us how market forces, and particularly forces in the bond market, were harnessed to accomplish what Patrick Wolfe refers to as the elimination of the native, which is itself a, the precondition for the settler state, the government that ensures replacement of Indian people with settlers, which has been uh, among the most, it might be the, uh, arguably the most central dynamic of US history. Now, again, this work is is new and the figures I'm citing here are things I've put together from a lot of the documents uh, and some of them might change in the future. But between 1851 and 1862, the state of California issued roughly $800,000 in what were called Indian war bonds, IOUs from the state with varying rates of interest between 7% and 12% interest on these bonds. In soliciting investor capital to fund campaigns of Indian removal and extermination, as they called it, the state made a solemn promise to repay the funds at date of maturity, usually five or 10 years from purchase with annual interest payments in the interim. And widespread speculation in California's war bonds took hold. These are, uh, this is an, a war bond from uh, 1852. It's in the 7% interest category, $250. Uh, and you can see the native man at the top waving goodbye, the figure of the vanishing Indian being pictured on the instrument, financial instrument that is meant to ensure that he indeed vanishes, right? And these are coupons for interest that you would cut off. They're, they're perforated, actually. You take them off and you would take them in on a, a, usually every six months to collect your interest until the bond matured when you would get your money back. Now, the speculation in these bonds took hold, but repayment of the bonds fell into doubt. For state lead, leaders never intended to return the money the state borrowed or to pay the interest it owed. Customarily in the United States, states that spent money on military campaigns against Indians could seek reimbursement of those expenses from Congress, which under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, bears responsibility to provide for the common defense and to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, to suppress insurrections and repel, repel invasions. Now, 
we can question all right, how appropriate it is to talk about what's happening to Native people as insur a suppressing insurrection or repelling invasion, but that's the clauses of the Constitution on which, uh, by which Congress justified reimbursing states for campaigns by their militias. In the 1840s, Alabama, Missouri, and Louisiana all sought reimbursement from Congress for Indian War expenses, but they outfitted their militias and then sent vouchers and receipts for those expenses to the Secretary of War, who reimbursed the money. California, on the other hand, sold bonds, took money from investors, and then told Congress it was their job to pay the investors their money. And for investors, the redemption of California's war bonds turned out to be contingent on federal payment of all that money back to the state of California. And this approach created considerable problems for the state, for Congress and federal officials repeatedly balked at California's demands for payment, allegations of impropriety and influence peddling troubled the effort to redeem the bonds, especially the rumor that powerful financial interests had acquired bonds at steep discount and then bribed Congress to pay them, out, pay them off at face value or par value. State efforts to persuade the federal government to make full payment on the interest and lawsuits by bondholders against the state to force the same would make California's Indian war bonds a subject of controversy until the end of the century. It was nearly 1900 before the questions around the war bond issues finally were laid to rest. So my talk today, the rest of my talk today, will focus on these war bond issues and this controversy, and I have two main arguments. Number one concerns capital markets. As a remote outpost connected mostly by sea, by sea to the distant financial centers of the nation, California had to make, or people in California had to make capital markets, and this was particularly challenging. California's Indian war bonds were central to the creation of capital markets in the state. As a financial instrument that circulated alongside abundant civil bonds, uh, and they, be they become particularly hot items on what we call the secondary bond market, the so-called Indian war bonds were the only instruments to have a possibility of federal backing. And that promise that the Congress might pay them off actually makes them at different times very attractive to certain investors. And when it fly, comes into question, then less attractive, but then suddenly very attractive again. That's my first argument. The second concerns profits. The issuing of financial securities to fund genocidal campaigns allows us to understand the degree to which Indian killing in the Golden State became an extractive industry and a profitable one at that. Now, Indian killing had always been profitable in that Indian land could be brought to market and sold once Indians were removed. Michael Whitkin, in his recent book, Seeing Red, refers to what he calls the political economy of plunder, which is very important in understanding these dynamics. But financialization of Indian war in California was an effort to make the killing itself profitable for investors. It was contemporary with and slightly anticipated the surge in financialization of mining and water companies that characterized the state in this era. The rhetoric of Indian killing had close parallels with the rhetoric of resource extraction and financialization of genocide suggests how political and business leaders sought to make Indian killing as profitable as other forms of industry, particularly mining. Now, why the state would choose to issue war bonds puzzled Congress and the federal authorities who received the state's demand for payment. Other states, as I said, um, did things differently. They might issue bonds. There are lots of state bonds. In the 1840s, a lot of states default on their bonds. But those bonds tend to be for internal improvement projects, canals, roads. Uh, but with Indian removal, as I've observed above, bonds were not customary. Why did the California issue war bonds instead of just sending in receipts for military expenditures? This is the key, to key context right, to resolve that question. California's resort to war bonds was an expression of a larger dependence on selling bonds to fund state government operations. The state took on immense amounts of civil debt at the beginning, uh, in this period, at the beginning of statehood, some of it with very high interest. And this begins even before the United States Senate votes to make California a state in 1850. And here we have to go back and review that really tired old story that if you went to, Cal went to California high school, you heard over and over again, right, of California's admission to the Union. And I'm going to make it con it's very concise. 
Recall that in the West, after 1787, Congress organized areas as official territories. They declared them territories, and upon reaching a population of 60,000 free inhabitants, a territory could be invited by Congress to call a state constitutional convention. They submit the resulting constitution to Congress for approval, and upon Senate approval, the territory becomes a state. So all the, that's in the, all the history textbooks we know, right? But after California was seized by the United States in 1846, Congress never granted territorial status because they feared putting California on a path to statehood would inflame the slavery question, the balance of free and slave states. The place remained a possession of the United States under military governorship where Mexican law remained the law in force. In 1847, and again in 1848, residents waited in vain either for news of the forming of a territory or at least an invitation to convene, or perhaps an invitation to convene a state constitutional convention, right, a congressional invitation to do that. It never came. The beginning of the gold rush in 1848 and the push and uh, pushes this issue to the forefront, fuels ever greater frustration with Congress. Early in 1849, Influential merchants begin calling for a constitutional convention without waiting for Congress to invite them to do so. The military governor, uh, Brevet Brigadier Bennett C. Riley, Brevet Brigadier General Bennett C. Riley, goes along with this. He declares himself civil governor. He's a military governor, and he says, I'm now civil governor, and I'm saying that we're going to have a constitutional convention. Because basically a whole bunch of businessmen have told him, you can call for one or not, but we're having one. So he says, he just gets in front of it and says, okay, let's do this. Calls his convention, which uh, and they elect delegates in August. They meet in this place down in Monterey. And they get a constitution together by October 13th. Uh, they, this, following the new constitution, they have elections. They elect two senators. They elect two congressmen. They tell the whole congressional delegation, here's the constitution. Take it to the Senate. Get it approved. Get us made a state. Good luck. And they send him off. Now, all of this, of course, was extra legal at best and illegal at worst, a point repeatedly made by Senator John Calhoun of South Carolina during the Senate debates, obviously for other motivations of his own. But these debates and the notorious Compromise of 1850, which senators negotiated to allow California statehood, have been a subject of much scholarly attention and don't concern us here. What does concern us is what happened back in California. The first state legislature convened on December 17, 1849. They would adjourn in April of 1850. That's the building they convened in. This is a replica they built in San Jose in 1849. I have, I'm 1899. I have no idea why they built a replica of that building, but it, the things people think are fun, right? Uh, historical memory and all of that. Um, they, they convened the legislature here. Again, December 17, 1849 to April of 1850, the Senate, U.S. Senate doesn't vote to admit California as a state until September of 1850. From the beginning of this legislative session, all the way to after it ends, right, and all the way for four months longer, leaders of the state governed without authority. There's no state government. There's no state. The whole thing is sort of propped up on hopes and ambitions, the state government has not been recognized, has no way of earning money, but has to run a government nonetheless. This was a condition that had peculiar fiscal results, to put it mildly. There were lots of needs. There's no building to accommodate the legislature, the courts, or state offices. There's no public hospital, no public insane asylum, no state prison, and there's no tax revenue either. There's no money. So the state's going to have to go into debt to fund things. Now remember, what I'm doing here is laying the context for why they're going to issue war bonds, right? But right now, I'm showing you how the state is going to borrow money just for daily operations. So the legislature sets out to get a loan. They actually pass a law that says, anybody who wants to give us $200,000, um, if you come meet with the treasurer and lay out your terms, we're super interested. It's actually a law. That's pretty much the text of it put in, in, in contemporary right in my voice today. But that's pretty much what it says. Apparently, this failed. And on February uh, 1st of 1850, again, well before statehood, the legislature authorized what was called a temporary state loan, issuing $300,000 in bonds at 3% interest per month. 
That's 42% a year. That's how much they have to pay or promise to pay to get people to buy the bonds. Now, uh, again, this is not a war bond. It's a civil bond and to fund non-military government operations. But issuing uh, all of these bonds payable for the most, they're supposed to be payable in six months, but they end up having to extend it because they don't get enough buyers. And although bonds against the temporary state loan were issued for a relatively short time in relatively small quantities, the interest is so high that they spend all the tax revenue they start getting paying that interest. And to fund daily operations, they have to issue more bonds, which they continue at, at lower rates of interest. It goes down to like 7%, right? But they're issuing bonds after bonds after bonds. Now, uh, just as an aside, these bonds, there's finally an investigation into this sequence of bonds. In 1948, <laughs> when the Earl Warren administration says, um, why, we're still paying, actually, we're just issuing bonds to pay debt that goes back that far because they never had any way, never set any way to repay it in the law. But in any case, uh, the, at this point also, to pay for things, the legislature was issuing state scrip and interest-bearing warrants to pay state bills. So if you wanted to buy, the legislature wants to buy pencils from your shop, they're going to come in and they're going to write you a warrant right, for the cost of those pencils and hand you the warrant. And when they get some money, you can bring it in and they will pay you right, what the warrant is worth with, with some interest. In these conditions, with state operations floating on a sea of paper, the state's bond issues were not easy to sell. And according to the state's governor, John Bigler, reporting to the legislature in 1856, it was not until a much later period that the bonds could be sold for more than 60 cents on the dollar. So one of the things that happens with bonds is if you're not a good risk and you issue a $1,000 bond, right, you can find buyers, but only if you drop the price. And the bonds end up going out on the market for a $1,000 bond will go for $600 or less. And then when you bring the bond, you will collect interest on $1,000 with that bond. And then when you bring it back, they will give you $1,000, right? It's great for the bondholder if it pays off, but the price differential there reflects the fears that the state will not be able to make good on this. The whole thing, as my undergraduates put it, is pretty sketchy, right? It's not a state. They're issuing state loan bonds. Who, are they going to be a state? We don't know, right? The whole thing may not happen. So. Uh, it, this, is, this is the context, the sea of paper, um, and the, the, ro the very high prices of Gold Rush California anyway, adds, makes everything very expensive. You go in to buy those pencils, and the pencils are a dollar for a box of, I don't know, uh, probably a hundred in, in 1850, um, and you present a state warrant, the guy who owns the shop might say, oh, no, 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 that's two dollars for you then. You write that warrant for two dollars, because I'm taking a risk here. I don't know if the state's going to have money to pay me off. Right? So that's the context for, uh, the, the, for this, the issuing of war bonds. The point of this is the state borrows money in one form or another to do just about everything the state had to do. And they would borrow vast sums to massacre Indians. Indeed, of all the state's many activities, I don't, as best I can tell, no single state activity appears to have consumed more of the state budget than the mustering of troops for Indian killing. Militia campaigns were often large, dozens of men required in the field for months at a time, uh, all of them needing food, guns, ammunition, medical care, horses, food for horses. Bigger militia operations included ranks of teamsters, hostlers, blacksmiths, and others. Much of the time, in 1850 and 51, they traipsed the countryside for months without finding any Indians to attack. The Indians fled further into the mountains, right? But when they did find them, they surrounded Indian villages in the pre-dawn hours and opened fire, killing every adult they could. Now, all of this raises a question. If it's so expensive and the state has no money, why are they doing it? California's native people, most of those affected in these early campaigns in particular were Southern Maidu and Miwok. There were others. Uh, they had long experience of colonization and showed no signs of being hostile to Americans at all. In fact, they'd been very accommodating of Americans. Many of them worked for white people to make a living. Uh, the governor estimated in 1850 that about half of the people working in the mines in the hills were Indian people, who many of them working for white miners, right, and others trying to work for themselves. They had been denied reservations, and they will be denied reservations in the future, where they could claim protection under federal law. 
But the rapid loss of land and depopulation of game led many, or led some, to cattle killing. And this was the most common excuse for Indian campaigns among Californians. The beef were in danger. So why do these really big campaigns? Well, racism, of course. Um, I think there's a lot going on with these militia campaigns that is hard to explain on the face of it. I think part of these big ones where they go marching around for months and find no native people to fight and then end up with a bill of a quarter of a million dollars, right? Part of what's going on is making a show of state power terrorizing Indians. Right? That's, that's partly what's happening. Again, authorizing people, in a sense, to kill Indians on their own. If they're turning out this many troops, these Indians must be very, very dangerous people. Right? But I think also what's happening here is it paid good money to participants. A minimum of $5 a day on these campaigns, which was a very good wage at the time. So often went up higher than that, 6 7 or $8, more than that for officers. Um, if you had a horse, you could rent it to the state for a dollar a day. Uh, some of what I found suggests that quartermasters of the militia outfits got a militia, a, a percentage of militia total expenses, $10,000, $12,000 at the end of the campaign, uh, which is an extraordinary amount of money. Um, and again, that's some of what I've seen, and I have to figure out how that works. The state could fund all this, they thought, because they would be reimbursed. The state wasn't making money off it, but they were dispersing funds to voters who were and they were keeping them employed and terrorizing Indians. Now to pay for all this, they borrowed money from other investors for the purpose of defraying expenses which have been and may be incurred. There's a 12% war bond uh, issued in 1851. There's another war bond issued in 1852. Uh, and then there's, there are others amended. Uh, this is amended in 1853, and there are others after this throughout the 1850s uh, that, are, that are issued. Now, with the printing of these war bonds and the distribution of these war bonds to buyers uh, meant that in total during the 1850s, the state of California authorized bond issues of about 1.6 million. They seem to have actually sold, again, around 800,000. Again, those numbers are tentative. California has all of these bonds floating around, civil bonds and war bonds. But only one category of, the, of these stands a chance of getting paid by the federal government. That's war bonds. And which one do you think is going to attract the attention of the richest, most powerful investors? The bonds of 1851 and 52 would prove particularly troublesome and remain a subject of controversy for decades. After several false starts, the state succeeded in persuading Congress to pay the bonds. And on August 5th, 1854, Congress allocated over $924,000 to do so, paying the bonds and interests up to January 1st, 1854. They're gonna redeem the bonds a little early. The state has the right to call them in early from the, from the investor. So uh, it looks like it's gonna get paid, great. But getting paid proved harder than, people, than the people who masterminded this plan had ever imagined. There was a sticking point in the law. Because the bonds were issued for war expenses, the Secretary of War was responsible for dispersing the funds to pay them. In the law of 1854, Congress authorized the Secretary of War to examine into and ascertain the amount of expenses incurred and now actually paid right, by the state of California in the entire period before January 1st, 1854. And the Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, takes this charge to mean he is to do an audit of all the expenses. Once he had actually entered, uh, ascertained the amount paid by the state, the law said the Secretary of War was to pay an equivalent amount not exceeding $924,000 allocated by Congress into California state treasury. So do the audit, whatever you find, pay them not more than $924,000. It may be that the size of the debt had uh, itself had led Congress to write, the, uh, write this extra vigilance of the state into the law. Um, in the 1840s, I mentioned other states get reimbursed for, for Indian campaigns. Georgia, in 1842, was reimbursed for the Seminole, Cherokee, and Creek campaigns in the amount uh, of $175,000. Uh, in the 1840s, other states were reimbursed smaller amounts. Louisiana also participated in Seminole campaigns in Florida. Uh, eight, they got $61,000. Seminole campaigns go on for years, bloody Troop, many troops killed, many, many native people killed, 
people pinned down, you know, uh, plat basically soldiers pinned down in the Everglades for long periods of time, very expensive, messy war. And they're getting much smaller amounts than what California has spent. In 1851 and 52, uh, California spent an enormous amount of money on these Indian campaigns. By 1853, the total state debt was just over $2 million, about $2.2 million. $771,000 of that debt was for militia campaigns against Indians, about a third of the total, of, of the, of the total state debt. Whatever Congress's motivations, the power of, rev of review granted to the Secretary of War impeded the bond redemption. On July 18, 1855, Jefferson Davis announced he would refuse to disperse the funds because he'd seen only bonds. And he said, I don't see any original receipts here. Other states send original receipts. You want to give me receipts? We'll talk. Otherwise, no. Sends a note to the governor. Providing that documentation was nearly insurmountable. Californians whine and complain. The, uh, uh, Senator John Weller of California complains on the floor of the United States Senate. Uh, a, lot of the, a large amount of the vouchers have been lost um, and can't be produced at the Treasury. Uh, the bond commissioners that are, that are back in the state of California say that the, bond, the vouchers are informal. Right? And we looked at them here in the state, and we think they're good. Just take our word for it. They generate copies, right? In 1856, California makes copies of vouchers and receipts, sends them to the War Department, dispatching them with a board of war debt commissioners who accompany these documents to Washington, rent an office, and begin to appeal to the War Department for full payment of the bond issue. But Jefferson Davis, again, re re he rejects the request, saying these are copies, original receipts. Right? I need original receipts. Uh, the commissioners get very worried. They, they write letters to the governor saying, this is going to take a lot of delay and difficulty. Um, and so at this point, they apply to Congress for relief. They say, can you give us a bill? Tell the Secretary of War to pay us, which Congress agrees. Uh, but then things, Congress produces a bill. But before they can vote on it, the congressmen run into uh, a, a storm of opposition from the bondholders. The bondholders say, we don't like this bill to pay us. Um, the, the Board of War Debt Commissioners would say, could describe it as violent opposition, influenced to a great extent by the holders of the bonds who felt aggrieved at the manner of distributing the appropriation directed by said act. The commission, once more taken aback, goes back to Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War, and says, okay, the bondholders don't like that bill. Let's go back to the old bill. Here's some original receipts and books. And they have some meetings with auditors that apparently don't go well. They're very cagey in their report. They say, um, as a result of these meetings, all the books and original papers in our possession were handed over. Um, we became convinced that the interest of the state would greatly suffer should a settlement be made upon such a basis. In other words, a lot of these expenses are going to be disallowed. And the bonds are going to be rejected by Congress. And the state is going to be on the hook to pay those investors. So. With this threat hanging over heads, they then go and meet with the bondholders. They say, what do you want? And the bondholders tell them, and they take it to Congress. And Congress passes a new law. It says, we're going to pay not the state of California. We're going to pay the bondholders directly out of the U.S. Treasury. But only up to the date authorized by the original law, January 1st, 1854. If you bought bonds after that, if, you, if bonds were issued after that, we're not interested. In re if there's interest after January 1st, 1854, we're not going to pay that. January 1st, 1854, if you, everything before that is good. We'll pay it and pay it directly to the bondholders. What made the bondholders so angry that they rebelled against the one law, against the one law and demanded it be withdrawn in favor of another? Well, the congressional debates are very clear. That dis the dispute was over paying the state of California, who would then pay the bondholders, which entailed sending gold to the state, gold coin, and having the money dispersed there. Uh, when, as Senator Weller observed, I think kind of letting the cat out of the bag, uh, because there's a lot of anger about this back home in California, um, he says, he describes the bondholders, and he says, many of whom are in this city, in Washington, D.C. Right? Why are bondholders of California Indian war debt in Washington, D.C. 
that's where they want to be paid, right? Um, there's another issue here too, which gets a little technical. Um, and that is that the state, when they redeem bonds, typically what they do is they take bids for redemption. That is, they say, we have some money to pay these bonds. Institutional, big investors, tell us what you'll take for the bonds in your possession. And it's big investors who want to dump the bonds, get the capital out, maybe make a smaller, small profit but not get full par value, can say, I'll take 98 cents on the dollar. I'll take 95 cents on the dollar. They bid against each other. The state picks the bids it likes and then starts to retire a lot of debt. Um, at, at a kind of discount for the state. That's the way states are supposed to behave, and it is written into the law in California that that's what the state is supposed to do when it redeems these bonds. They don't do that. They don't call for bids. They pay full value, all the interest up to 1854, directly to the bondholders, which raises this, this question. Who are these bondholders? Now, I only found out I only got a hold of the bond registers this fall. And that was a fun moment for me. Uh, it was very exciting to, when they pulled them out of the archive. I said, Do you, I called the, you know, wrote to the state archive. Said, the law says there's supposed to be a register. Do you have a register? There. The same day. We got these. It's just a call number. So I went in and these huge volumes come out. This is the temporary state loan. Um, it's not the war bond. This is the civil debt bond, that big 3% a month bond. They called it the 3% loan. Right, um, And you get names here like C.E. Buckingham. Buckingham, there's something funny going on. He's the county treasurer for San Francisco County. Um, he owns a lot of these. That's something odd. But he's a local guy. These are all local people. Um, De La Guerra, who's a big family, right? Santa Barbara, a Mexican family, ranch, ranchero family. Uh, the Buckingham again. And over here, John Perry Jr. He's a former a stock trader from Boston. He was a member of the New York Stock Exchange. Comes to California. He's in San Francisco. He'll later on be important uh, in our story. But the whole thing here is they're local people with money. There's a lot of funny things going on in this register, but they're the folks you kind of expect to find here. When you look at the war bond register, it looks very different. Now you can see they're all redeemed in Washington, D.C. over here. We don't know who initially held these bonds, who bought them initially. We only know who redeemed them. John D. Maxwell, woof, uh, Chubb, Chubb Brothers of Baltimore, big bank. Uh, George Riggs Sr., George Riggs Sr., Elisha Riggs, Riggs and Company, oh gosh, Sweeney Rittenhouse and Fant, right? All of these bankers. There's a guy name here, Guy Pelton. Just occasionally an individual name will show up. Remember Guy Pelton here for a minute. Uh, Riggs and Company, right? And we can go on with these lists. Uh, John D. Maxwell, who is he? He's actually a partner at a bank called E.W. Clark Dodge, which is a big investment house in Philadelphia. Uh, John D. Maxwell, all of these bonds, thousands of dollars in bonds, bought and redeemed by these people, right? But the biggest holders are Riggs and Company. Uh, George Riggs, George Riggs, George Riggs, George Riggs, George Riggs, right? It's thousands and thousands of dollars. And so what does all of this mean? Well, uh, the story of Riggs and Company tells us a great deal about the linkage between US territorial acquisitions, acquisitions, the development of investment banking in the United States, and the formation of capital markets in California through Indian war bonds. Riggs and Company began as in Georgetown in 1836, as a small brokerage house under the ownership of William Wilson Corcoran and George Washington Riggs, who in 1840, or sorry, uh, and they, they partnered to create Corcoran and Riggs, which expanded operations of the old brokerage. And then uh, they go into checking and deposit services. But the real engine behind their expansion came from lobbying federal officials, who made Corcoran and Riggs the only federal depository bank in 1844. About this time, the bank bought the old Washington headquarters of the Second Bank of the United States on Pennsylvania Avenue, 
which was a building across the street from the U.S. Treasury Department. Not a bad place to be. It's all about location, although that building doesn't look like it should have been the headquarters for the Second Bank of the United States. It just looks like somebody's house, right? That, that will change in time, as we'll see. Another symbol of their high-level ties, in addition to being across the street from the Treasury Building, another symbol of their high-level ties was their acquisition of President John Tyler as a depositor in 1841. Then President James K. Polk became a depositor in 1845. James Buchanan, Abraham Lincoln, and others. Riggs Bank became the Bank of the Presidents, and a total of 22 of them would, be, uh, would bank with Corcoran and Riggs and its successors. No bank was more closely identified with the rapidly expanding U.S. in the 1840s, and no bank did more to connect the U.S. territorial expansion with what we would come to know as investment banking. In 1846, the Polk administration was desperate to pay for the U.S.-Mexican War, and they were afraid to raise taxes because they'd get a tax revolt. And the way they solved that was to issue bonds and they, to sell the bonds to the public. Now, they had sold bonds. The government had sold bonds to investors to pay for the War of 1812. But this is the first war where bonds are marketed to the public. And the bank that takes primary responsibility for that is Corcoran and Riggs. And they do a superb job. In 1848, when the last bond issue for that war is really flagging, they partner with Bering Brothers in London and they sell the bonds in Europe. It becomes the first war in American history for which no significant tax increase is necessary. Pay for the war with bonds and you're in, right? Now, it was of course this war, the first funded by bond sales to the public, that brought California and the rest of the Southwest into the United States. So in a sense, it was fitting that Riggs and Company, as the bank became known after the retirement of William Corcoran in 1854, would dominate the redemption of California's Indian War bond issues of 1851 and 52. Corcoran retired to become a philanthropist. He's considered the founding father of modern philanthropy. He founded the Corcoran Gallery of Art, among other things. According to the bond register, which again lists bonds held at redemption, George Riggs, Elisha Riggs, and the bank itself, Riggs and Company, held $37,000 in these 12% high-paying war bonds. But uh, with, they were working at the time, it turns out, with E.W. Clark Dodge Company and John Maxwell, who partnered together. Those two banks together owned $134,000 worth of the $177,000 issued, and there are other ties to these other banks in here. Now, um, all of this maneuvering, of buying up of California debt by, by powerful banks to uh, make a huge profit off of the Indian War bonds was a controversy in California itself. The Sacramento Daily Union would say that the bonds were ordered to be issued in, eight, this is an article in 1863, the bonds were ordered to be issued in 1851 under circumstances of a very extraordinary character. They had been on the market for several years and sold at a very low figure less generally than 25 cents on the dollar. Right? The bonds were floating around and nobody was buying them, according to the Sacramento Union. They went out of the possession of the original owners in a very short time and were accumulated in the hands of a few speculators. Corcoran and Riggs, the wealthy Washington bankers, either owned or controlled the large majority of the bonds by distributing a considerable portion of them as reported at the time to senators and representatives. They succeeded in carrying through Congress a bill to pay the Indian war bonds dollar for dollar. Guy R. Pelton is a congressman from New York City. George Vail appears in the bond register. They only own five to $6,000 of bonds. George Vail is a congressman from New Jersey, right? Um, they're being dealt in by the banks is the allegation of the Sacramento Daily Union. This is what it looked like if you wanted to buy bonds issued by the state or any of the cities of California you could look in the newspaper and they would give you these prices. And what you see here, for example, is this is 1854 and 55 bonds issued after these big settlement I'm talking about. So it's not clear when or if they're going to be paid. And you can see they're selling at between 40 and 45 cents on the dollar, right? This is the secondary bond market that operates in California in the 1850s. It's often called the stock market, let's say the stock table. Um, you get one of two things when you look up stock market in these newspapers. You'll get either an actual livestock market and prices of cows and horses, or mostly bonds. 
Bonds are the beginning because all of these cities and counties, like the state, are issuing bonds to pay for daily operations, right? So uh, throughout the documentary record, these rumors and innuendos swirl about illicit arrangements between bondholders, the state commissioners responsible for redeeming the bonds, and California state uh, senators would be complaining about this through the 1860s, that the state had been ripped off by these powerful bankers who basically got, got their hands into the bonds when they were cheap, and then uh, Congress just paid them, paid them in full. Now, there was still another problem here, though, and that is when the War Debt Commission agreed with bondholders that they would only pay the interest up to January 1st, 1854, all these bonds have coupons on them to get interest in 1855 and 56. So the War Debt Commission just cuts those off. They take the bond. When they redeem the, the bond, they cut off the coupons they're not going to pay. They're supposed to throw those away. They push them back across the table to the bondholders and say, these are yours. Riggs and Company, uh, E.W. Clark Dodge, all of these people, they go out and sell those bonds back into this market, sell the coupons back into this market. The owners of those coupons buy hundreds of thousands of dollars, in some cases, worth of coupons if they're paid at full value, and then begin lobbying the state to lobby Congress to pay them off. The state hires a special agent in Washington, D.C., who works for decades to get these things paid off, and it fails. Right? But the controversy isn't finally settled until a number of court cases in the 1890s. California would continue to issue war bonds through the 1850s, and then during the Civil War to issue war bonds in support of California volunteers in service to the Union. Uh, but after 1862, the, the focus of investors shifts to the, stock, the San Francisco Stock and Exchange Board or the San Francisco Mining Exchange. Many of the people involved in California in the early bond sales become the prime operators here. John Perry Jr. becomes the first chairman of the San Francisco Mining Exchange, which is the biggest mining exchange on the West Coast and the site of fantastic frauds and manipulations, right? In mostly mining stocks from Nevada, the so-called Comstock load, the Comstocks, which are uh, spectacular frauds, again. That, uh, that history, is part of what I will be working on with the book, but I think that some of that origins of speculative paper, right, begins in the story of these war bonds. Riggs and Company became Riggs National Bank by the end of the 19th century when they commissioned this new building on the Pennsylvania Avenue address and a vast new building at 9th and F in Romanesque revival style. That became the bank of ambassadors and foreign dignitaries, including the Saudi royal family, um, they're still the bank, we're still the bank of some presidents, Richard Nixon had accounts at Riggs, the most important bank in the most important city in the world, and then it all fell apart. They remained in business until the early 2000s when a series of money laundering scandals laid them low. Two of the 9-11 hijackers had accounts at Riggs Bank. Uh, other foreign dignitaries included, uh, included Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet, on whose behalf bank officials hid assets and lied to federal regulators, the bank was closed and sold to PNC Bank in 2005. Now, the old Riggs Bank building at 9th and F is now the Riggs DC Luxury Hotel. You can look it up. It looks really cool, but I don't think I can stay there with the history I've been talking about knowing that. Their Pennsylvania Avenue building is now occupied by the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream, founded by philanthropist and one-time bond salesman Michael Milken, who was convicted of securities violation in the early 90s and barred from securities trading, but pardoned by President Donald Trump in 2020. Conclusions here. Um, uh, just three conclusions. Number one, early capital markets in San Francisco were all about bonds, and Indian war bonds were the most reliable investment in the market for having federal backing. Subsequently, the bond market became much more about, or sorry, the, the market became more, much more about corporate stock, and many of the people involved in these maneuver, these operations were involved in that. Secondly, turning Indian killing to profit suggests the importance of financialization in Indian war, a profit making, turn, making it a profit making industry, like railroads or mining. And third, doesn't help explain why California was such a murderous place for Indians. 
Uh, and it really was. I mean, I've done a lot of work on the plains. The plains is a very different kind of phenomenon. There's plenty of Indian killing and Indian hating happening on the plains, but not like California. Right? Nevada, too, different. Right? California really is the murder state in many ways. Campaigns not only cost the state nothing, but became a way of securing profits for investors. Uh, do those investors lobby for more campaigns? I don't have evidence of that yet. They certainly don't object to them. For the state of California, the point is Indian killing was free. And these military campaigns, underwritten by bond sales, turned powerful U.S. banks into key investors in the dispossession of Indians and the making of the settler state, which earned Indians only destruction and lend salience to ongoing efforts among Indian communities to take control of financial assets on their own behalf, which is a big thing in our own time. Uh, Indians taking control of their own trust funds and creating Native American development corporations and all of that is a response partly to this kind of history. Right? Okay, um, those are my conclusions. I'm done. Thank you. Louis, I, I'm thinking that uh, Jennifer Burns might agree with me that uh, not since, with the conspicuous exception of our colleague uh, Destin Jenkins, no one since Milton Friedman and Anna Jacobson Schwartz has brought so much animation to financial history. <laughs> <laughs> Would you agree with that? I do agree. I do agree. I was going to sneak out. Can I ask a question before I run? Yes. Do I get to answer before you leave or no? <laughs> Inside that, I was curious about your ambition to connect this story to the broader West or kind of put California back in the West. Can you say a little bit about that? Yes. Um, the, the, issues, the issue becomes, for me, I just wrote a, I mean, the trouble with doing a history of California over such a period is California means many different things, right? And, and explaining all of them in one book is a tricky proposition, which is why there are so few one-volume histories of California in that period, 1848 to now, right? Um, the, the story here about native dispossession and the financialization of it, I think what I've trying to do initially was just to write something about the gold rush and its connection to these mining securities. And what occurred to me is just that we get so preoccupied by the gold rush itself that we start to think ridiculous things like, oh, the state of California had tons of money. I mean, they're producing all this gold. Well, all that gold is going out into the world market and going to mostly to the British Empire. It's soaking up a huge amount of it. And it, in California, we have a very peculiar situation where a state that's producing so much treasure has no money, right? And Understanding these things that happen behind that spectacle of the gold rush is really important. And I think that this allows us to connect the, the genocide of that period in a new way to the conditions of the gold rush itself in terms of, of finance. And I think that that's so. And then in terms of putting California into the West here, um, there's a lot of work. I was doing a lot of work in Southern California. Um, in Los Angeles and trying to figure out the financing of the early land booms in, in Los Angeles, for example. Los Angeles County has the biggest land rush in the entire West, 1887, 86 and 87, the land boom there, much bigger than anything you would ever see in Oklahoma. The Oklahoma land rush is so famous. The land boom in, in Southern California is enormous. Where's all the money coming from that people are spending to buy that, that land? And I didn't, I haven't quite figured that out yet. It comes through Los Angeles banks, which also are very small and have no money. So the whole thing is kind of curious. I'm very interested in connecting things like uh, these, the, what we talk about, the material realities of kind of westward expansion with these abstractions of finance and capitalism, because I think they're absolutely key. When you put California back in the West, right, one of the things you realize is that California only develops the way it does partly because it's a, it, it has this vast western hinterland. Those states develop the way they do because California grows so much faster than they do in the 20th century. Uh, but in the 19th century, part of the story here is that California's growth is not what we think. We tend to think California started growing in the gold rush and it went and went and went and went and we got to today and boom, here we are, Silicon Valley, the richest state in the country and boom, just, it just went. Up to 1900, not so much. 
California did not attract settlers after 1852-53 the way it had before. And this was a real, real crisis for the state. So trying to kind of, if you put California in context with the rest of the West, in some ways it starts to look more like the rest of the West, and in other ways you understand why the rest of the West looks so different, right? And how the whole thing is tied to these cycles of investment, right, and finance is, is part of what I'm, I'm trying to work on. Yeah, I, mean, I think you've connected it really well to D.C., to New York, to the kind of banking um, <clears throat> world. The other thing that really strikes me is that Silicon Valley ethos of fake it till you make it, <laughs> Goes away. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're not a state. Give us money, and we'll make it happen. So. Absolutely, and and that that whole history of nineteenth century American culture, right? Karen Halton and confidence men and painted women, and all of the kind of uh, the, the huckster con man kind of emergence of that figure, right? You look at these guys in California, and you're just like, holy moly, what a bunch of operators, right? Um, operators who do get taken, right, as often as they're taking people. But yeah, that's that's that that I'm I'm uh, that wasn't the most coherent explanation answer to your question. But thank you. Thanks. Good to meet you. Yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Um, thanks for a fantastic talk. Um, I have sort of a two part question. The first one is. One of the details you said at the beginning of your talk was about how these the men in these militias were making five dollars a day, six dollars a day potentially, and also renting their horses back. You know, that this is at a time when people are making a dollar or two a day, perhaps, you know, in wage labor. So what's justifying? You know, is this just people taking advantage of, you know, there's money around? It's, California has a terrible labor problem because people, particularly men, white men, want to be speculative. They want mining claims and they want to sell those, right? So every time anybody has a rumor that there's a new gold strike somewhere, they go running off and chase after it. And everybody will tell you keeping employees is just almost impossible. And the, the wage that you have to pay people to do that is about $5 a day, which is very expensive, right? It inflates the, co I mean, the cost of goods in California is very inflated. So uh, what it is is they can't compete with other jobs if they don't pay $5 a day. They often have to pay more than that. And then federal, rate, federal examiners will eventually look at some of those accounts and start to say, you can't pay your militia more than we pay our soldiers, which becomes a huge problem for California, right? Uh, but $5 a day, yeah, was, was what you had to pay to get people. I mean, that was the, the base wage to get people to work for most concerns in California. Okay. And the second part of this is, I, can you expand a little bit on this too? Something you said at the end of your talk was you know, California is different in this regard. So that this is not like the plains, this is not even like Nevada. Can you, you know, is is this is California different because there is this bond market that's underwriting essentially a war making state that is you know to, that is the infrastructure to exterminate people? Um, is that is it, you know is that basically the answer? Is that California has this separate structure? that no other place develops in this. I, it, it might be a part of the equation. Uh, Oregon and Washington territories have a terrible Indian war, um, terrible for native people. They slaughter them uh, in immense numbers, 1854 and 55. A lot of those people have been in California, a lot of the people who are doing the killing, and had come down to California from Oregon and went back. That, because those are territories and not states, the federal government picks up that debt and issues war bonds Oregon war debt, it's called, to pay it, right? And those places also have very, very murderous. But I, you look at the plains, and, and there are a bunch of different things that condition the responses here. There's a case in 1866 um, that is famous in its day where three, uh, three white men go out and they kill a Lakota Sioux headman and two other, two other native people in cold blood. They just murder him right outside his village. Um, and instantly, every newspaper in the, in the region is saying, you got to catch these guys and hang them or we're going to have an Indian war in our hands and we don't want that. That's bad for investment. Now, there are plenty of times people try to gin up Indian wars to get contracting from the government. That happens. But there's also the reverse case where if you get an Indian war, nobody will come settle here and we won't grow. And Lakotas can wage war. 
They are well armed. They are mobile. In 1866, they can retreat still to a vast region that the army has a hard time getting to. They're formidable that way in ways that I think California Indians are not. California Indians tend to be not as well armed, and they're not as mobile, right? And mostly, I, California Indians seem to be trying to make it work, right? They know they're used to having colonizers around, right? So, what makes California as murderous as it is? I don't know yet, but I do think the bond market is part of the explanation. It, it's just so lucrative for peop, for the state to get this money and just hand it out to people. Right? That's such a popular thing for a governor to do, right? Uh, and people who are between things and don't have any work can go do this, right? And a lot of times they do end up traipsing around, not finding Indians, spending a lot of money, and coming home. And, and uh, other times they, they kill a lot of people. So um, I, I just think it is it's part of the answer, yeah. Yes, um, I guess two points. One, you did mention disease. I, I was under the impression disease was a much uh, stronger uh, cause of the demise of the Native American population in California than uh, the genocide effort. It, it, is, it is a very, you're right, disease is, is absolutely crucial. And uh, in the figures I was showing you, right, some of that is, is disease. Although, there's very, relatively little smallpox in California as opposed to other places. Malaria hits the Central Valley in the 1830s and is made terrible, right? terrible death toll. Uh, but there, there's quite a bit of disease, but disease in itself wouldn't do it. Um, disease, starvation, and continual fear of violence together, uh, and enslavement, as my colleague Andres Resendez has shown in his book, The Other Slavery, right? Enslaving native people, enslaving people is, it just drops birth rates into the, below the ground, right? It just, uh, it means people don't have children. And there's a lot of enslavement of native children and of native people out of this as well. And all of these things together, disease is part of the equation, you're right. Again, the impression I have is uh, Native Americans, Indians uh, are very poor they're pretty passive. Uh, so this image of uh, warlike, you know, uh, tribes with weapons is contrary to the sort of the image I have. I, mean, you're, I think you're challenging that. Uh, and so if that's the case, what is it? There's an economic argument you're making. And what is the incentive of vigilantes other than just getting paid to kill people? Yeah, uh, to go after and, and just being psychopathic. There's a, there are a lot of psychopaths out, you know, in the, in the borderland regions. You, you run into that. There's a lot of, but exactly, what is the incentive? And a lot of people will point to the Indian Indenture Act of 1850, right, which says you can take an Indian child and make them an indentured servant, girls to the age of 15, boys to the age of 18, and then they later on amend it so it's girls to the age of 18, boys to the age of 21. Right? You make them an indentured servant and you can keep them uh, until they are, I don't, I think it's till they're either till the age of, it's in the law, or they actually extend it further beyond that to like 25. And you can work for them, make them work for you and you civilize them and show them Christianity. Um, what these vigilantes do is they kill the parents and they sell the children. You can, you can sell an indentured servant in any of these towns in the Sierra Nevada and in the Central Valley for $50. That's the going rate for an Indian child. California is nominally a free state, but as Michael Magliari and others have shown, there's a thriving trade in, in Indian children. There's an Indian agent in 1861 who finds some people, these guys have got six or seven Indian children, and they want certification that these are orphans um, and because they, and they'd like to make them indentured servants, and they like to civilize them. And he says to them, how do I know they're orphans? And one of the men says, um, well, their parents are dead. He says, how do I know their parents are dead? He says, well, I killed some of them myself. Right? And there are up to 20,000 Native people in indentured servitude by the eight, later 1850s. And a lot of people point to this as a big driver. Uh, but the other thing is just there are a lot of people who, um, when it comes to cattle killing and so forth, who, who, will, blame, who will say, we, we just have to exterminate. The word they use is extermination. And they try to make it real. There's, this particular incident is a depiction of the massacre at Round Valley, which was so bad that the state of California actually did a big investigation. They didn't do anything as a result of the investigation, but did one of the local judges 
who participated in this and helped fund it was a man named Hastings. He's the guy whose Hastings Law School is named for, and they're now changing the name of the law school because it's finally, right, it's, it's become unacceptable that somebody that involved was. That, those wars are partly about securing cattle range. There's a lot of talk of you can't sell land if you have Indians living on it. People don't want to buy it. Now, Indians will be working for white people, um, and, and living nearby, and there are a lot of people who just say, we just need to clear Indian people out. I don't have all the answers on why Californians are so murderous, right? But they, they really are. And uh, some of it is economic. A lot of it is, I, there's, there's something going on in the 1850s, too, with race hatred and, and what the kind of violence of the 1850s. Think of bleeding Kansas, right? Uh, there's, a, there's just a lot to think about in, in that period. Yeah. Yes. yes, thank you. That was fascinating. I'm, I'm glad you think I live and grew up in the West. I always thought that. But um, it, it seems to me ironic that you're doing this presentation on the arm of one Leland Stanford, who was a great capitalist um, in a very, uh, at least in terms of his financial success. But I'm wondering if there's more of that context that somehow explains what you've described in terms of the era of not only gold, but speculation, capitalism and speculation on the railroads and other investment and risk taking um, in California. I think it's fascinating what you brought. I remember Roots Bank from living in DC, but and the growth of and, and the role of the East Coast. I think that's something we should understand better as well. But is there anything else about the context in California at that time that might explain or uh, some of these, well, I mean, the use of bonds and the interest in bonds. Yeah, I mean, the entrepreneurialism of the American West, right, it, is is a real thing. You, one of the things I, I used, people would always ask me when I was working on the planes in the 1870s, I would get questions from audiences a lot about, was the show Deadwood realistic? Um, if you ever watched the show Deadwood, which is an absolutely terrifying show about Deadwood, South Dakota in the 1870s. And one of the things I always liked about that show was the way they, sh every, every male figure in that show had three businesses going on, right? You're running a saloon, uh, running a, an express delivery outfit, and, and basically trying to get um, timber claims or uh, some kind of mining claim and dealing in those on the side. Doing all of these things because there's no social safety net at all. And these are guys living without family. Right, which is your only social safety net, pretty much, in, in the West. And uh, it, it, people are very, very entrepreneurial in that way. And I think the idea of make, taking financial risks for a big payoff is obviously corresponds to what the gold rush, the central dynamic of the gold rush, which is risking everything to go out to California and digging up treasure, right? striking it big, which happens to very few people. Right? But I do think that that does create a culture of risk taking that is, that is different. And that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to employ people. They don't want a steady wage if they think they're going to miss the big payoff, right? Um, yes? Uh, we've seen politics of fear recently. Mm -hmm. And it is something that bonds people together. And it seemed to me with many of the incidents in the 1830s and 40s, there was this notion that the Indians were bad guys. Yeah. And therefore, there was some fear that people would put money down on what money to, to fight the Indians, even if they were passive as California tribes. Yes. Do you think that has? Sure. I mean, I think it may be that all of these, I mean, you look at these militias, they, these guys come from all over the place, right? There are a lot of Irish. There are a lot of other folks. There are uh, Spanish-speaking Californios in the militias. They basically, you know, traipsing around together, you could see as a way of bonding together against a common foe and creating an identity as a, as a new public in the state of California. I think that, that there's, there are arguments that, I mean, as a, cultural historians would make arguments about what did it look like when you, these militias went by? What was the parading of them like? They would sort of look at these things to talk about what did that symbolically represent to the people who were in it and people who saw it, right? Um, and those kinds of questions, I think, can be, can be really, really useful. And I do think the fear of Indian attack, 
right? And the fear, the, the ability to drum up that fear is, is it's just constant. And the, the, the way it's described always is so-and-so was attacked in his home. Um, these, these people were attacked in their home and they were all killed. It's always a home invasion. Well, and, they, and scalped, certainly, right? Bodies are mutilated. It is always a threat to uh, the domestic order in the home itself, right? It's just absolutely terrifying, that specter for people. It still is. The home invasion robbery in our time is the one of the most terrifying specters you can call up for people. And I do, so absolutely, yes. I mean, I think that the fearing Indians is a useful political tool and social tool. Yeah. Of any of the... Uh, uh, Native American tribes that were subject to this genocide made claims for reparations. Well, this is one of the things I'm, I, I am hoping that this work can serve, uh, you know, can serve in that way, is that you looking at how much money was spent and how much money was made, if I can calculate that, um, it give you, give you a sense of part of what some kind of reparations could be. There are certainly Native people talking about reparations. I don't know that much about where that is in California right now, right? Um, and it's it, it what the those people who you know, Eloise Cabell, who was Blackfeet uh, and a MacArthur Genius Award winner, right, was one of the was the person who is tribal treasurer for the Blackfeet Nation. It's the one who started saying, "Where's all our money? We're supposed to have all these trust funds and all these treaties that gave us trust funds, and where's the money?" And it's, when she looked in, it was like, the mo- we've been ripped off. They've been spending our money on other things. And, and uh, that kind of, she would say, uh, when she accepted the big settlement of $3.4 billion, right, they accepted that payment, she said it's an underpayment. But these people who've been ripped off are going to die soon. And we need to get them their money. And I don't want to hang in court longer trying to get a bigger death settlement. So that's not reparations, but it is. There, things are moving that way. So I, I don't know that much on, to answer your question. I do hope this work can be helpful in that regard. Yes. Yes. Um, I was interested in your comments about um, the gold rush money. Because uh, I too was under the impression that California was booming after 1850. But you were saying actually the cash was filtered out largely to the British Empire. Does that mean that Bearings and other British banks were instrumental in underwriting some of the mining bonds then in California? They, the British banks, oh, those are target number one, right, for Americans. They've got, that's where the money is, right? Um, they, there's some early foreign investment in gold mining in California, and of course, the investors get burned very badly. And so they leave. They don't, and there's virtually... Investors, just think, or British investors, or European investors get burned. Um, the, uh, foreign investors get burned. I think some of them are English in the, early, in the earliest wave. But then they, they retreat from the gold rush, and the gold mining companies, the big ones that get formed in California, are mostly family-owned privately traded companies. But when we, 1859, the big silver strike in Nevada, which is it's basically a colony of San Francisco, and you get the deepest and richest silver mines in the history of the world, right? And it, it, those attract a huge amount of foreign investment. And there's a lot of English capital that flows into those and into the American West as a whole. It's, it's the primary source of capital is, is, is London, right? And so those are very important in the development of the West, uh, those investors. And that's part of why I want to link these stories, California and the West, right? To exp- California, linking California to the rest of the West to show there's a network of investment here that's fairly consistent, right? That, that stays away from California a certain amount of time and is then paying in, buying a lot of bonds uh, and buying a lot of stock in California. Some of the investors in this bond register remain unnamed. Um, Palmer Cook and Company, which is a really crooked bank, banking outfit in San Francisco, I mean really bad. Uh, they take the, they are paying bondholders in New York on behalf of the state for a lot of their civil debt who remain unnamed. And I don't, those could well be foreign investors, because New York is the primary place that, that those bonds would be paid for that. But I, I haven't been able to prove that yet. So, Louis, let me thank you for getting... <laughs>